What's going on guys? It's Nick here, back with another video. It's Saturday, it's time for my favorite video of the week. As always, sponsored by our friends over at Underdog. We'll be going over what I think the best pick'em picks are this week. But as I said last week, they also have the way too early playoff tournament for best ball. So if you want to draft some best ball teams for the NFL playoffs, you can do that over there as well. There are only nine states that do not let you play in either pick'em or best ball, and those aren't even the most populous states. So for the vast majority of you, you can do both or at least one of them. So if you haven't signed up for an account today, do so now. Use promo code FFA. They will match your first deposit up to $100. That is free money. You can use it either in best ball or in the picks we go over today. So let's start things off as usual with this week's 21 bet. Now, for most of the week, like a lot of the times I look at the picks on, if I have time on Tuesday, usually it ends up being on Wednesday. I look at them, usually one game clearly stands out. Uh, a lot of the, you know, the lines are off. Or I really think the game's popping off. That didn't really happen this week. Nothing was standing out as a clear and obvious play. I have 22 picks listed on the website. We're going to go over 10 of them today. And for the vast majority of those, they're like one-offs this week. Again, a lot of the times there's like one or two games that pop off. Not as much so this week. But the one that did as I was kind of preparing this video was Cowboys at Vikings absolutely a chance this game does not go off we don't hit the overs here but we can look at these two teams and say both teams are great offenses obviously that's what we want for a game to have people hitting the overs we want consistent high scoring like really just good offenses and the number two explosive players because as we've talked about a lot think about almost the um the titans and the packers game from I guess last night for me, two nights ago for you guys. And for like a lot of 49ers games, I guess. When we have these good offenses, but ones that have players who aren't necessarily explosive a lot of the time, like Henry's obviously explosive. But when Henry doesn't hit, you get this Titans offense, they can take nine minutes off of the clock, run like an 18 play drive, and that just destroys the game. We do not want that happening. We do not want you, these teams, Going down the field slowly, five, six yards a pop, not hitting deep. We want explosive players on each side. So when we do these bets, we want to include those explosive players because when they hit, we can get a lot of other things correlated with it. Now, my two favorite from this game right now are Hawkinson and Cook. Hawkinson, not going to call an explosive player, but, you know, nine and ten targets since joining the Vikings. He's caught 84% of those targets. His line's only 42 and a half, like... They have such a concentrated offense that that's the one that I like the most from this entire game. Again, not an explosive player, but like if this game is back and forth, he's probably hitting. Then the big one is Dalvin Cook. Uh, he's played at least 76% of the snaps in four straight games. He's gone over 84% in three of four. Like he's really just like being featured this season. He also has 71% of the team's carries over that time. Now, we know Dallas is a strong defense. So this isn't a game where we have two great offenses against two trash defenses, right? Like everyone knows Dallas has a strong defense. But they've now allowed the fourth most rushing yards per game, including 145 rushing yards per game to opposing running backs over the last four weeks. You can run on Dallas and teams have found success in doing so recently. And while the Vikings are definitely a pass first team, you know, they're not a ground and pound team. You don't think that they watched the game last week when they're preparing for this and they saw what Green Bay did to Dallas running for over 200 yards with Dylan and Jones combined. Like, obviously they saw that and they're like, well, we have a pretty good running back on our team. They found success. Why can't we find success in that area? I'm expecting Dalvin Cook to approach 20 carries. And if he hits 20 carries, he's pretty much a lock to go over his rushing total in 28 career games with at least 20 carries. He's hit his current over in all but three games. So he has 25 and out of 28, 25 and three overall. Again, hits that. He's probably going to get there. This is where things get a little bit tricky. And also, just to kind of finish off the Dalvin Cook thought, he's an explosive player as well. We saw that last week. He can hit for a 60-yard touchdown at any point. That basically secures his over while also getting the other team back on the field. It just makes a ton of sense. The tricky part is that as I was building this out, it's like, okay, we're going to get to a point where we actually have to choose which quarterback we want. We probably can't include 
both quarterbacks in the bet because if we do, then we're taking Kirk Cousins with only Cook and Hawkinson, and that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. If Kirk Cousins is hitting his over, it absolutely means that one of Adam Thielen or Justin Jefferson is as well. Like Hawkinson and Cook, to get enough receiving yards between those two to hit Cousins over, like it just makes sense you have to include one of them. And when I'm looking at that, I'm saying, okay, if I include Justin Jefferson, let's say in this bet, and I say Justin Jefferson is going to hit for a big play, he's going to be consistently used. Now we have Jefferson, we've got Hawkinson, we've got Cook. It guarantees that like we need something explosive on the Dallas side. We basically need CeeDee Lamb. Like there's just no way you can put this together and say, oh, I want like Dalton Schultz on the Dallas side and then just to stack up four players or something on like Minnesota. Like Schultz is an explosive player. You need something on the Dallas side to really continue getting this game going, keep them aggressive. So I feel like if you're going to play Jefferson, you pretty much have to play Lamb. And if we like Hawkinson and Cook, well, now I've got, you know, three players on one side, two of them pass catchers. I pretty much have to include Cousins. So I think the five players you should include are Justin Jefferson, CeeDee Lamb, Hawkinson, Cook, and then Cousins and not Dak. And the one thing that kind of gets me by saying I think that's okay not including Dak is that they do have two running backs going to use. It seems very likely that Zeke is going to play this week. Um, Minnesota has a weaker defense overall than Dallas does. You can definitely run on them. And we have to think that like Dallas still is a team that wants to run it. They're not, they're not going to go out there in an ideal game script for them and throw the ball 75% of the time. That's not what they want to do. And so we can have Lamb hitting still in a game where they're using Pollard, they're using Zeke, they're still playing through those two mainly, and then also throwing the ball to CeeDee Lamb, who's very clearly the top wide receiver. And that could still create a game script where Dak doesn't hit. I mean, think about last week. They ran like 83, 85 total plays. They went to overtime. We still hit, taking the under on Dak Prescott's passing yard. So I think Dak can still hit, but if we're talking about like what's most likely, we have these other four already in the bet. It just makes sense that Kirk Cousins would be the player we want to add and not Dak Prescott. So for those of you listening, uh, not watching the video, I'm going to post everything on the screen. The lines for everyone are Hawkinson over 42 and a half receiving yards, Dalvin Cook over 79 and a half rushing yards, uh, Lamb over 77 and a half receiving yards, Jefferson 99 and a half Kirk Cousins, 260 and a half over on all those. So all those also, I would take them together. So I wouldn't be like, oh, Nick likes this game, but I'm only going to take Justin Jefferson. That could certainly hit. But like, again, like I'm saying, if Jefferson hits, it's more likely that these other pieces in this game are because this game is probably um, playing a little bit faster. Um, one team is finding success, and so the other team is forced to play a little bit more aggressive. Like It just makes sense that you're not taking one-offs, go all in, or don't play this game. If you want to do like three, maybe you want to do like, I don't know, Dalvin Cook, Jefferson, and Lamb. You don't want to go all in. That's fine. Um, I personally would just go all in for this one. But if you don't want to play that, or you want to play that, you know, a little bit and then kind of take some other ones. Here are some, I guess, five of my favorite solo plays. We're 70% on my top five plays so far this season. I feel really good about it this week. Uh, I guess technically it's three solo plays, and then the last two are going to be correlated. You want to play them together. So number one, as a solo play, Pat Frymuth. Over 41 and a half receiving yards. This is my number one confidence play in the week. Although I say I feel very similarly about number one and two. I'd say that's like probably 50-50 which one I like more. But I have a slight lean towards Pat this week. Um, we have talked about this since Claypool left. Pat benefits probably the most of any player because they ran similar routes over like the middle of the field. And when you remove Claypool, they were actually giving a lot of the Claypool role to George Pickens last week. But Pat is just going to operate in the middle of the field, going to be very targeted. And we look last week in like a brutal match. I mean, maybe the most difficult matchup for tight ends. He still had seven targets. And that was also in a game where they were winning. They just didn't have to throw the ball late in the game. They could kind of slow it down, run the ball. Like not going to happen most weeks. They are underdogs this week. We don't expect that to happen. And so he's just a very safe play. The odds that he gets like 10 receiving yards are very, very low. If he misses, he's going to be right around this number. He already played them earlier in the season. They play the Bengals. 
Uh, he had 75 receiving yards on, I believe, 10 targets in that game. He's got a 21% target share since returning from concussion in week seven. Uh, and like I said, he did fine last week, didn't do great, but it was in a brutal matchup. It's not as brutal this week. Um, I'm not expecting, you know, Pickett to throw for over 300 yards or anything, but like I did out the math and basically as long as he has an a 16% target share or more, he's very likely to hit this over. I have met like 21, 22% right now for him to be under 16%. I mean, it probably means that Deontay or George Pickens are going nuclear. And so I think that you're, you got to basically take one from this game. I feel like someone's got to hit their over. My favorite is Pat. After that, like I said, pretty much the same confidence is Dave Montgomery over 61 and a half rushing yards. As you know, Lil Herbert out for the next four weeks. He's on the IR. And I think we can all agree that like Ebner is not going to be stealing very many carries, maybe a few targets, but this is rushing yards. We don't care about those targets. Like basically Montgomery is going to be featured and the Falcons have been ripped apart on the ground recently. They rank 25th in rush defense DVOA now. Uh, they are technically more attackable through the air. So if you were putting together a game plan on a normal team, you might lean pass heavy, but Chicago doesn't really care about that. And it's not like they're great against the ground attack like they're not you know number one in rush defense to way but super attackable through the air we saw a team like uh the Bengals ripped them apart through the air they were like we don't even need to run the ball we're just going to throw it every play uh and just destroy them through the air well that's not what the Bears are going to do they don't even want to you know throw the ball like they ran the ball 58 percent of plays against the commanders that's a clear pass funnel if you want that they still ran the ball a ton uh the Bears have a game plan it's to run the ball. They're going to find success. Like if they're not finding success, sure, they could lean past heavy, but they're going to. So I'd imagine they're going to stick with it. Um, and I just, I can't imagine the Falcons are just all of a sudden going to start stopping teams on the ground. Like the Bears are still a good uh, rushing attack and like, you know, Montgomery is still very good. And let's be honest, like he was already getting around. Like we probably would have projected him with Herbert playing around 14 to 15 carries in the spot. And that is all he needs, he needs like 15 to 16, basically, to hit the over on average, not even really boosting the matchup, which we should do. Like without Herbert, he's probably got a floor of like 15 or 16 carries. And so his floor is that he ends up around 50 or 60 rushing yards. And if the worst case scenario is that he's approaching this total, that means he's going to hit it way more often than 50% of the time. I definitely like that over. After that, I like Chris Olave over 53 and a half receiving yards. This one is much more just like a bet on talent play. Um, you guys know I'm in love with Chris Olave. I think he's a phenomenal talent, um, going to be a superstar in the league. Obviously, Dalton's a problem. Like Dalton is not good. He's not a good quarterback. We really, really want Winston. Like I think my projections have like, it's like 20 yards. Like if you had Winston as a starting quarterback, you could probably boost Olave like 15 to 20 yards. That's how like much of a difference it is. He'd be a smash at over 53 and a half. It's not a smash as much over that uh, with Dalton at quarterback, but even projecting Dalton to quarterback, uh, even going in there and dropping. So based on what he's done this season, because the matchup's not easy against the Rams. I dropped his yards perceptions. I dropped his catch rate. I took three and a half, I think it was, plays off of the average for the Saints this season, saying that, like, you know, the Rams aren't going to be, like, destroyed on defense. We don't think that this is going to be a game where we have a bunch of back and forth, a lot of plays. And so I took that down. I did all of that. Even doing that, like, he's still projecting way over this number. I believe it's at 70 right now. And there's, like, nothing I can do to get it to approach 53. I mean, he's clearly the Saints' best wide receiver. The Rams, let's be honest, like, do you think the Rams going to do anything on offense this week? Like, I've been reducing the plays because the game's going to be disgusting, right? The total's, what, like 39 points. Neither team is going to steamroll the other. It's probably going to be a lot of punts. But, like, that's also kind of the point. It's like the Rams are not going to sustain drives without Cooper Cup. You really think they're going to just start, like, destroying the Saints' defense uh, like, they haven't even been good with him. Now you remove, like, the best offensive player in the league. Of course, they're going to play terrible. So there's going to be a lot of punts. It means the Saints are going to get the ball back plenty of times. So should we even be reducing the plays that much? Because it's not like the Saints have run that many plays this season. Uh, he's hit this over in six of eight games since week two. And the two times that he didn't, like, that's already a great number. The only two times he didn't, he played 
37 snaps in their blowout win over the Raiders. Like, they just didn't need to do anything. They won, what, 24 to nothing. And then he only played 36 snaps last week against the Steelers. So in just like a normal game where they're actually running plays, he's probably going to hit this over. And there's even games thrown in there where he didn't run that many plays. Like, the team didn't play that much, and he still went way over the total. So again... Play volume can hurt them if the game turns out to be really gross. Both teams are, you know, snapping the ball with like three, four seconds on the play clock. But even if that's happening, I just don't expect the Rams to sustain any sort of long drives, any sort of success consistently on offense. And so I don't think the Saints are going to have as much play volume issues as most people are projecting this week. The final two are, like I said, correlated together. And that's Nico Collins over 40 and a half receiving yards and Davis Mills over 223 and a half passing yards. Obviously, if I like, uh, if you're going to take one, take the other. Like the odds that Nico goes way over his total, like that's just going to boost that basically for Mills. If Mills is hitting the over, I mean, unless Brandon Cooks has like 150 receiving yards, like it's only him and Nico Collins really for the wide receivers. Mills has hit this over in only five of nine games this season, so only a little bit over 50%. But most of the times, at least three of the four times where he's you know hit the under here, they make complete sense. And even the other one makes sense when you kind of look at the play volume. Like the first under was at Denver. Yeah, he's going to hit the under at Denver. That makes sense. The next one, I would say like going into it, maybe we thought he'd have more success at Jacksonville. But it was a game that they ended up running the ball 56% of the time. I don't think that's going to happen this week. And so you can kind of throw that one out. And then the other two were Titans and Eagles. As we've seen in recent weeks, the Titans have been really, really good defensively recently. And we know that passing on the Eagles isn't exactly easy. And so it's like you look at all these spots and you're like, yeah, that wasn't a great time to take the over for Mills. And another thing we can look at is say, well, okay, like he didn't even have Brandon Cooks in one of those games. He didn't have Cooks or Collins in another, like he's got both of them back healthy right now, and he's going to take on the commander's defense. And we know it's much easier to throw on them, especially to wide receivers, than it is to run on them. They do have a very strong run defense. And you look over at Collins, he set this over in five of six healthy games this season, and it's coming off a 10 target game. We also talked about earlier this week about how if you are the Texans, right? You don't really view Brandon Cooks in your long-term plans. I mean, he's already frustrated. They stripped his captain's badge. Like, he is not someone they're like, oh, yeah, we're going to have Cooks for the next three years as our lead receiver. That's what they kind of view. I mean, I guess John Mechie when he returns. But Nico Collins is at least in the picture for them. Like, he's someone they want to build around on offense. They want to be utilizing consistently in their passing attack over the next few seasons. And this is not a team that's expected to make the playoffs this season. And so as we kind of go into the, the later portion of the season, it makes sense that they'd scheme a lot of looks to Collins. And we saw that last week. He had 10 targets. He'll get downfield work, red zone work. Like he's just going to be utilized. And he's also a big play threat. Like that correlates really well with Mills. If Collins does hit on a 30 or a 40 yard reception, well, now you're putting all that on Mills, you're pretty much guaranteeing Collins hits his over. Like it's just really nice to stack together. And if you want to go further in the correlation, I don't have any of these listed as like the top 22 bets this week, but it does correlate well with the opposing ground game. Like we do know Houston is a team that you just run on them. When you are playing the Houston Texans, you run the football and that's how you win. Like it's just so easy to run on them. And so it makes sense that if you want to say, okay, Gibson or Brian Robinson take the over on one of their rushing yards. Like if they hit for a big play, if they're finding a lot of success in that area, it means the Texans are probably down. If the Texans are down, they need to throw the ball that correlates well with Collins and Mills. So if you want to take one of them, throw it on, make it three players in the slip. I'm absolutely fine doing that. I don't have them listed because honestly, I don't even know which one you would take. You have to just guess on which one your favorite is. I suppose my lean would be Brian Robinson, but I can almost guarantee you that the line is like 15 to 20 yards in favor of Robinson. So you can check the detailed rankings on the website. Um, I believe though I looked and they're both pretty accurate. So up to you. If you want to add that on, I think that I'm just going to take the Collins and Mills portion, just take both of them. Uh, but if you want to do that and then also add on one of our other top five favorites, you want to do three people from that Dallas and Vikings game, do whatever you want to do. So 
Those are my favorite underdog picks this week. We are 2-10 and 10 on the 20 to 1 so far, 70% on the top five picks each week. So hopefully we can continue to find success this week. And if you want to tail any of these, Sign up for an underdog account today. Use promo code FFA. They will match your first deposit up to $100. That will give you $200 in the account. Do not use that all in one week. Portion that out over the rest of the season. But you can either tail some of these picks. You can enter those playoff best ball contests. It's only $10 to enter. You can enter a few of those. Have some fun in the NFL playoffs. And again, many of you. Don't think you can play in any of these, but let's be honest, there are only nine states where you can't do both of them, where you can't do like, you know, both of them combined, you can do one or the other, and they are not the most populous states. The vast majority of you watching this maybe think that you can't, but you definitely can play on underdog. So good luck to everyone this weekend. That, my friends, is in this one. Hope you all enjoyed. If you did, how about hitting the like button? How about subscribing to the channel if you're new here? Thanks for watching.